Hello, everyone. Uh, I just wanted to say before I start, a nice thank you to Oxford MBAs for organizing this whole thing, as well as uh, the night last night in the Debate Society. We had a lot of fun, so thank you. So I'm going to jump right into a story for you guys. So I was coming back the other night after a long day of working with my classmates at Judge Business School. We were working on this very long project, so I was very tired and hungry. And it was one of those typical rainy days in Cambridge. So when I got back to my, uh, my dorm, I was living on the fifth floor, and I saw the elevator was about to close. So I immediately jumped in to try to catch it, because I didn't feel like walking that day. And when I entered, I saw a girl standing in the corner with one of those oversized backpacks that you see undergraduates typically wearing. So I said, sorry for uh, entering the last one. I hate to be that guy, you know, disturbing the peace and all, but... But I didn't get a response from her. Perhaps she didn't hear me. But really, it was because she didn't see me. And why is that, you think? Well, she was hunched over her phone as if the secrets of the universe were contained inside of it. The world around her, the elevator, me, simply did not exist, simply did not matter. And yeah, you could say, well, maybe she was shy or she was sending a text message or an email. But the question I want to ask is, should this behavior of not looking up and being aware of the world around you, should this, should this be the norm? Now, man is a social animal. So when we're happy, we want to share our happiness with the world. And when we're unhappy and miserable, we need companions in our suffering. Dostoevsky, the master describer of human suffering and pain, puts it this way in a story of his. A man is lying at home on his couch, and he has a terrible toothache that's been bothering him the whole day. And he's groaning this disgusting, horrible groan that makes everyone near him want to escape at the, the first hearing of it. And he keeps groaning, even though he knows he's keeping his family awake at night, even though he knows they loathe him for it. The groaning, of course, is not making his pain go away. The key reason for this man's groaning, Dostoevsky contends, is a simple desire to make his family suffer with him, to be a part of him. It's his simple desire to let the world know, I exist, and I want you to be a part of me, to suffer with me. Now, with mobile phones, you can groan as much as you want. You know, wherever you are, whether you went to the supermarket at night, and you're in line after a long day of work, or you just missed the plane at the airport, and you have to wait six hours in the middle of the night. You can let the world know about your suffering and pleasure with your current state. Now, that's one thing. <laughs> Sorry, I've forgotten the rest, but yeah. But the problem is, we're constantly talking to those who are similar to us, who understand us. Essentially, we're communicating with a world that's a reflection of ourselves. And uh, this is great in the process of feeling good about yourself. But in the process, you're shunning the world around you. And because it's not easy, because it's not the default option. Now, a friend of mine, Giovanni, said, well, hasn't this been the case throughout all of the time? Haven't we always been like this? And I said, yeah, yeah, we have. But the critical difference now is that we're constantly confronted with this choice to either engage with the world around us or engage with the world inside of our phones. And more and more, we're choosing the latter option because it's easy, because it's familiar. And I believe this choice is going to change things drastically. Now, so I used to use Facebook. I'm six months clean now. <laughs> it's been a struggle. Um, but when I did use it, it was, up to, it was in the run-up to the US elections. And uh, that was a very contentious point for me, and for a lot of Americans. I don't know if any Americans, I'm assuming there's a lot of you in the crowd. But I remember I would read these articles and I would get this urge to post something, to express my dissatisfaction and just pure annoyance with everything that was going on. 
I wanted to be heard. I wanted the world to know. And naturally, my friends are from the same liberal and privileged backgrounds as I am. Whenever I did post, I only got likes and comments like, preach, brother, preach. Yeah, man, right on, righteous. <laughs> and it felt, it felt good. It felt really, really good. I'm not going to lie. Uh, and anyone who didn't agree with me was either ignorant or uninformed. Now, if the last couple of years have shown us anything, it's that we're moving more and more to this us and them mentality where we fear the foreigner, where we fear the other. And I don't want to imply causality, but as you can imagine everything I've said so far, I believe mobile connectivity is feeding this division. Now, I want to ask you, when was the last time you sat at home for a few minutes and just did nothing? I, I can't do it. I'll be, uh, I'll, you know, it'll be three in the morning, I'll come home after a night of, you know, doing whatever, and uh, <laughs> I'll uh, be sitting on my bed and I can't sleep. And I need to look at my phone because maybe someone texted me, maybe, uh, maybe something just happened. But with mobile phones, we have constantly this need to do something. And, uh, you know, in the process of trying to live life more connected to the rest of the world, we're ignoring the essential. We are ignoring the beauty of the very and absolute present. And, uh, and that is just not going to be the right thing for our mentality. And the more and more we do this, we get into a world where it's all about my desires, my beliefs, my life goals. And gradually you pull yourself further and further away from the rest of humanity, where life just becomes about me, me, and me. And naturally, you know, I'm a business student. This is great for business, perfect for business. Corporations capitalize on our individualistic tendencies to maximize our own self-gratification. And the more we use our phones, the better they know what we want. You know, I'll be, you know, sometimes I'll be on my computer doing some banal thing and I'll see some pop-up with an ad with a product that I, that I really want. I'm like, oh, this is great, that's great. But I don't remember searching for it ever or ever searching for anything similar. And that's kind of weird, that's kind of creepy, yeah. And I think this has happened to a lot of us. And this is going to be even better with the rise of AI and big data where brands can know exactly what you want and when you want it and can deliver it to you immediately. Man, that's, that's great for business. That's great. And it's great for the consumer. But is it great for humanity? So Karl Marx describes the history of mankind as the history of man's increasing control over nature. And at the same time, he describes it as a history of man's increasing alienation from society. Alienation can be described as a concept whereby man is dominated by forces of his own creation, which confront him as alien powers. Now, what I'm trying to say with this is that with every technological innovation, there will be positive and negative impacts on society. But the critical difference is, with the mobile phone, is its ubiquitous presence. Every day, when you wake up, when you go to sleep, it's always there, begging to be used. It seems... It seems that we've created a product that rules us. So, yeah. So what do we do? Where, how do we unshackle ourselves? I don't think I have any magic wand solutions, but I can offer you a few thoughts and observations from my own personal experience. When I was 11 years old, I attended a Catholic school for the first time. And as part of the school, I had a religious studies class, which for a, a kid who had just gone through puberty is not the best thing to, you know, on the outset, it sounds terribly monotonous and boring. But I loved it. And uh, the favorite part of that class for me was the, the section on Eastern philosophy, where we had to sit in silence for 10, maybe 20 minutes. You know, no talking. And yeah, it was hard at first, but what I remember 
is that in those moments, I felt this absolute peace and serenity that was a complete contrast to my constant life of play and activity. And I think at a broader level, these pockets of not doing and just being might be just enough to develop a better sense of connection with the self and the world. And when we are doing, I believe there's a value in reflecting on what you are doing. With Facebook and texting, you're constantly thinking about the next one or the previous one. Maybe we can try writing in our own handwriting once in a while. Let me give you a story on that. So my ex-girlfriend, she uh, was not the most expressive person. And when you brought her into a group of friends that she didn't know, she wouldn't say much. And my friends would ask her, ask me, well, why is she not talking very much? But at the same time, she was an excellent writer. And we, when we were doing long distance, we used to exchange handwritten letters together and uh, instead of calling on the phone sometimes. And I've read those letters hundreds of times. And each time, every word that she writes, every scribble or whatever, is her. And there is no amount of Facebook texts and messages that can make me understand her the way I did and do to this day because of those letters. Now, you might say I sound like a romantic. Uh, well, maybe not, I don't know. Well, well I am. Uh, but I think, I think more and more people are coming to this mentality. You know, movements are starting across the world to create these pockets of silence and reflection away from the buzz of information. In Amsterdam, cafes are now refusing to offer Wi-Fi in public places. And in Norway, students are working on an igloo serving as a zone disconnected from the rest of the house. As Matthew McCullough would put it, information, similar to, environment, uh, similar to uh, noise pollution, deserves its own form of environmentalism. And when it comes down to the individual level, I think we can all do things a little differently. And critically, it's the awareness that you can act differently, that you can behave differently, that makes us essentially human. As I used to tell myself, and to this day I still tell myself, you don't have to smoke a cigarette. You don't have to. Just don't do it. So the next time you're walking on the street, or you're in Starbucks, or you're in the tube doing whatever, simply look up and acknowledge the world around you. Perhaps acknowledgement is the first step to developing a better connection of self and the world. And after all, had that girl in the elevator on that rainy day in Cambridge, had she simply looked up and acknowledged me, given me a smile or a nod, you might have been spared this whole thing. <laughs> all right. Thank you. <laughs>